morning, good morning, Change Now. How are you doing? Clearly a handful of people were out partying night last night. It's okay, you can just put your hand like this if you were one of them. So then you don't have to embarrass yourself in front of everybody. Good morning, my name's Laval de Vincenzi. I am going to be your moderator for this morning. If you were sleeping, you're now awake. <laughs> It's a really important topic. We're going to be talking about the oceans and making the invisible visible. We already know it's a fact that 70% of the world is ocean, and yet there is still a lot that we do not know. And so this session is really about uncovering some of those unknowns, giving us some examples of what's possible in terms of regeneration, um, looking at some of the consequences and impacts that we're creating to our oceans, but also giving us some hope for the future in terms of what we can do going forward. We'll be going in three distinct sections, kicking off with a keynote that's looking at the deep oceans, biodiversity, really exploring what's happening in terms of marine diversity. Then we'll be having a discussion about what are the impacts, what are the challenges, what are some things that are happening that perhaps as land mammals we're just a little bit less familiar with. And then we'll be ending with a fireside chat looking at the coral reefs and what we can do to restore them. Does that sound like fun? It does to this lot, it's not so much to you guys. Okay, so I'm just going to talk to them for the rest of the time, if that's okay. Are we ready to get started? So our first speakers are a husband and wife team, which already is a win as far as I'm concerned, because working with one's partner is sometimes a great idea and other times it, it's taking commitment to a whole nother level. They are a pair of world-class deep sea explorers and they've taken the journey, uh, they are gonna take us on a journey with them on their deep life expeditions that focuses on marine mammal forestry. The marine biodiversity that's presented at the deep levels is very unknown, and this is truly going to be making the invisible visible. Um, before they come on, we are gonna watch a short four-minute video that takes, wait for it, 15 years of expedition and condenses it into just four minutes. So you might wanna watch quite intensely because it's either going super duper fast or they've only picked all of the most exciting bits. Uh, immediately afterwards, we will have Emmanuel and uh, Guillaume Bardo to stage. But first, a brief video. ...avec les images qu'on était allé chercher, des images extraordinaires qui témoignent d'un monde de glace, un monde en voie de disparition, au moment où Guilin, Emmanuel et leur équipe traversaient l'épaisse couche de glace pour accéder au monde merveilleux qu'offre l'océan Arctique, la suite d'Under the Pole s'écrivait déjà. Avec une volonté, confronter les capacités humaines au milieu sous-marin afin de mieux raconter et préserver les océans. Et alors, ça fait quoi de quitter ce monde-là Et on répond tout de suite, on reviendra. On s'enfonce dans les profondeurs, plus on a l'impression d'être sur une autre planète. On vit sous la mer, dans la capsule. Notre regard, il a beaucoup évolué depuis 12 ans. 
plus que jamais, il faut mettre des moyens et de l'énergie dans l'exploration scientifique. Que c'est porteur d'espoir, c'est porteur d'avenir. On a besoin de mieux connaître les océans. J'espère qu'on va trouver des gens pour nous accompagner et nous suivre dans ces missions-là sur le long terme. C'est l'échantillon le plus profond qui ait jamais été récolté dans le monde. C'est extraordinaire Et donc c'est toute la vision que l'on a du récif et de son fonctionnement qui est remise en cause. C'est aussi euh, la finalité de ce qu'on fait Under the Pole, la sensibilisation. Et c'est pour ça que euh, tout l'équipage est mis à contribution aujourd'hui. Et tout le monde est super content euh, de partager notre passion, de partager nos connaissances et ce qu'on fait. Deep Life, c'est un programme de 10 ans qui s'inscrit dans la décennie des océans. On va étudier dans le monde entier les écosystèmes profonds à travers la thématique des forêts marines. Et pour ça, on a dessiné le Why Not. Le Why Not, c'est un peu notre voilier océanographique euh, idéal. On l'a dessiné pour être à la pointe de la plongée scientifique. À quoi ça sert En fait, ces écosystèmes profonds, ces mondes sous-marins, ces oasis, euh, elles sont restées pendant longtemps dans, dans l'ombre. Et euh, aujourd'hui, on sait qu'on a besoin de, de mieux les connaître, de les découvrir pour leur conservation. Alors notre défi à nous avec Under the Pole, ça va être de rendre visible l'invisible. Hi everybody. So, as you have just seen in this short video, Under the Pole explores since 15 years some of the most remote places of the oceans. Oceans are big and there are a lot to do about their protection. After our first expedition at the North Pole, we decided to focus on what we were good at. We are deep divers, we are polar divers, we are expedition organizers. That's why we put our skills and energy in deep diving all over the world, especially in that zone that scientists call mesophotic, between 30 and 200 meters. When we speak about ocean, most of the people imagine that. A vast blue water surface. When we speak about Arctic Ocean, they often imagine an endless white desert. When we speak about the depths, they see planes of mud in the darkness. This is what we see. Parallel worlds hiding from the surface, and when you look a little bit closer, places where you can observe a great diversity of species. Okay. Um, these pictures were taken at the geographical North Pole, just in the middle of uh, the Arctic Oceans. Oh, there's a small, and th this is how we uh, we started with Under the Pole, and this is, uh, first expedition gave the, the name to our expedition Under the Pole. Maybe you can think that um, uh, in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, below the ice, there's no life. But in fact, uh, the life can be extremely diverse. And here you can see a sea angel, which is certainly one of the species that represents the most, uh, the best, um, uh, the beauty and the fragility of the Arctic Ocean. This picture uh, was taken in Tikeo, uh, once again, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this time we are at 100 uh, meters deep. And here, the coral coverage gives more space to some other species, like Gorgona, you can, uh, you can see here. And I can tell you, 
when you are lucky enough to dive at such a depth, you have a feeling to be in space. In Makatea, an elevated uh, island of the uh, middle of the Pacific Ocean, once again, uh, we have discovered an exceptional uh, coverage of coral leptoziris uh, from 60 to 100 meters deep. This is a very surprising richness which calls for two other scientific missions to try to understand the blooming conditions of uh, this spectacular garden. In Moria, yeah, here we are. There's a little bit uh, change in the presentation, but anyway. Uh, by 60 meters, uh, there is a, a huge coral of, uh, once again, the corals, uh, Pachyseris, Pachyseris corals, and that gives uh, another view of the reef, which is like a garden of uh, roses. Here we are in the cold, once again, uh, in Greenland, especially in Sisimut, just by the end of the polar night uh, in April. And the water is very close to the freezing point, 1.8 uh, um, degrees below zero. And despite these extreme conditions, ecosystem can be prolific, especially at depths where biodiversity is protected from uh, the sea ice or the iceberg erosion. In Lanzarote, in Canary Island, from 50 to 100 meters deep, uh, lies some marine animal forests of black corals, which offers habitat to a large biodiversity of species, uh, contrasting with the arid volcanoes that lies in, in the, the surface of, of the island. All these pictures are just a few examples of the beauty and the diversity of the depth that lies just a little bit below what we are used to see uh, in the oceans. Before continuing, just keep in mind that oceans are a continuity with no borders. Everything is interconnected from the surface to the great depths. So even if we can see the bottom of the oceans, our impact on shallow water will have huge consequences, especially on the mesophotic zone and their uh, very diverse ecosystems. Everybody knows the importance of forest on Earth. Everybody understands the role they play for species, biodiversity, and climate. When you see a forest burning or being clear-cut, you immediately understand the threat for the planet and the species. The fact is that the same problems occur underwater. People just don't see it. Like we have forests on Earth, we have forests underwater. Marine animal forests are home to many species that found there a hunting ground, a place for reproduction. They are essential for the health of the ocean, especially now that the surface ecosystems are threatened by climate change. On this picture, you can see the analogy between a forest being clear-cut on Earth and the deep sea ground being trolled. You immediately understand that the dramatic consequences for the habitat and the species are the same. Our oceans are burning. Our ocean forests are being devastated. Garbage lies everywhere at the bottom of the ocean, especially in the depths where no one comes to pick them up. As divers, I can tell you that it is extremely rare to dive without seeing fishing gears underwater, like lines or nets. The biggest problem with the ocean is that most of the humanity cannot see below. And this problem increases with depths or remote places like polar regions. Victim of its silence, the ocean had to wait for Paris Agreement in 2015 to recognize its central role in climate regulation. That's why the United Nations decided that this decade would be the ocean decade for ocean science for sustainable development in order to respond to this paradox. 
Life below 30 meters remains largely unexplored. As you can see on this graphic, knowledge decreases with deaths. And that's why they are mostly left be behind conservation plans. Why is it not studied? Because it's not important? Because it is not a priority? No. <clears throat> it's mainly because it's very challenging to get there. And it is even more challenging to drive science in that zone. We will explain the amount of challenge just after, but it is for that reason that we decided to launch a new expedition, Deep Life, which has been recognized as a program of the ocean decade because its research and results focus on this very unknown part of the ocean, but still concerning most coastline of the planet. As a passionate diver, there is always, on each single dive we are doing, this feeling that pushes you to try to go to have a look a little bit deeper or further. This is how exploration is about curiosity and inspiration, and think, I think that both uh, leads to passion. And passion can lead you to the greatest achievements um, as far as uh, you, hard, uh, you work hard. Uh, you put uh, a lot of perseverance and get patience, and get patience. And this is exactly how we, we came to explore the high Arctic and the depths of the remote places of the world. But as Emmanuel mentioned, it, diving in the mesophotic zone can be very challenging. It is complex, uh, it is difficult, and I will tell you why. The first point, diving deep is engaged. And the deepest you go, the truest it is. For example, working 20 minutes at 120 meters deep uh, will um, need about four hours of decompression to get back to the surface. I let you imagine that in the freezing water of the polar region. But at the same time, don't think that robots can do the same, because it is not true. Second point, um, deep diving requires huge experience, specific skills and equipment, and that is very long to get. Third point, operating science and deep diving in remote places is complex for questions of logistics, of organization, and for sure of funding. And the deepest and the furthest you plan to go, the more complex it will be. Another point is a question of the team. Operating science and deep diving, once again, require a specialized team. And when safety is constantly in balance, combined with harsh environment and hard work, the team has to be absolutely perfectly trained for his mission. Last point, question of innovation. Pushing the limit of knowledge needs innovation. It can be technical, it can be in the approach, it can be in the ambition of the project. On this picture, you can see an underwater habitat we named Capsule. We have been developed, we have been experimented uh, in the Pacific to observe and describe in continue the underwater world for days and nights. And just by the way, the capsule is just behind the, the scene, and you can have a look at it afterwards. As we have seen, um, exploration of the mesophotic zone is complex, but feasible in uh, safety and uh, with efficiency only if all conditions are met, the one I've just talked about. But today, Exploration for exploration is not enough. The complexities, the costs uh, of expedition, as well as issues such as global warming or biodiversity collapsing, uh, can only find a meaning if combined together with science and for conservation purposes. This is why, since years, uh, with Under the Pole, we have been doing partnership with scientists to try to answer together questions uh, that could not be answered alone. And by the way, I would like to thank for that, for their long-term support, the Rolex Perpetual Planet Initiative.
So, why does the scientific exploration of the mesophotic zone matter? Because it is hope. Over our expedition, it has always been an evidence that their ecology is diverse, is complex, and is specific. Let me show you a few examples based on our scientific results. Not exactly the right point, but we come to it. Yeah, here we are. First point, coral seascape are more diverse at depth. The second point is that coral diversity is unexpectedly higher at depth in the mesophagic zone, especially between 40 and 60 meters deep, and not in shallow water reef. And that goes exactly the opposite of what usually everybody thinks. On the Deep Hope mission in 2019, led by Laetitia Edouin from the CNRS, we discovered the deepest coral at 172 meters, this is a picture, revealing that coral can live much deeper than the scientific community thought. Mesophotic corals are nearly not impacted by bleaching in shallow waters. And this rise as potential refuge from the global warming. Those four examples show that in a part of the ocean that nobody can see from the surface, the mesophotic zone, there are very rich ecosystems. Their protection calls for huge scientific knowledge, and this is why we keep going exploring them through the Deep Life program. We can call them hope for the ocean if we protect them now, and this is why there is an urgency to make the invisible visible. <clears throat> so, making science, if results are not shared, is not enough. To spread the knowledge about oceans, you need to infiltrate everywhere, to communicate in different ways, to reach different audiences. In the media, in the social medias, we try to show the beauty and the importance of those ecosystem with documentary, book, and podcast. We invite artists on board in residency to share results, and we give public conference, like today. And because, again, our work cannot be separated from what it is done on the surface or in the abyss, we are stronger working together with NGOs such as UICN or the Ocean Climate Platform. We take part in national or international conference to make known the stakes of the mesophytic zone. For example, here is Gilan speaking at the USCN World Congress with our scientific director, Lorenzo Bramanti. With them, we contribute in reports or advocacy campaigns. But most of all, we believe education is a priority if we want to change the way we treat our ocean. That's why we make interventions in school, but also on the, on the field. Here you can see kids visiting our sailing boat Y and meeting a scientist who shows them one of the samples we took underwater. Here is Tim, a Greenlandic boy. While we were in Greenland, we took Greenlanders from all ages under the sea ice to show them the hiding face of their environment. In French Polynesia, we met more than 1,000 kids in 12 different islands, explaining the importance of coral reefs. Finally, we are aware that many people do not have access to the ocean. As we say, out of sight, out of mind. You may have seen a blue caravan in the outdoor part of Change Now. It is our solution to bring the sea to the land, a mobile unit to meet all audiences, whose final objective is to explain the impact of our actions on land, on the ocean. Education is maybe one of my favorite things about our job because you can immediately feel the impact you have. And by the way, please uh, don't hesitate to go to visit the caravan, which is just outside, uh, close uh, to the coffee and restoration place. So here we are. We hope that today uh, you discovered with us a new world and a new world, the Mesophotic. Uh, it is a complicated world, but uh, a beautiful place we need to protect. Thank you very much for your attention, and thanks for changing our.
Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Oh, you can no. give that to, okay. the, to them over there. My goodness, isn't it great to see what goes on in the depths of the ocean? It really does bring things to life, doesn't it? For some, for others, not so much, but we're getting there. It's, I get it, it's early in the morning, it's a Saturday. Um, I, I applaud you for coming out to really be behind change on a Saturday. If you wanna know more about what Emmanuel and Guillaume are doing, you can check out their YouTube series. So do go and have a look, look for them on YouTube. Uh, the next session that we're gonna be doing is having a look at, in a little bit more detail, some of the challenges of the things that are going on under our oceans. Joining me in this panel discussion, we have the founder of the nonprofit Women for Oceans and author of recent book, The Ocean and Us, Farah Abadullah. And we also have the CEO of Global Fishing Watch, Tony Long. Please give them an incredible warm Change Now round of applause. Hello. Either of those two chairs is beautiful. I love a little bit of like chair bingo, like, no, it's mine. No, it's my chair. Um, hello, Farah. Hi, John. Uh, um, Tony, how are you doing today? Hello. Doing really well. You will need microphones for this. It will be very helpful. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of shouting, and I don't want you losing your voices. We need them for good. Um, for those people who know a little bit less about you and the work that you do, Farah, maybe you can start. Can you tell us a bit about the work that you're doing? Because there's multiple levels to it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I have been um, active in the ocean space for the last 20 years. My passion goes back to when I was a small uh, kid. Um, and I've had the, the good fortune and privilege to spend a lot of time at sea, um, on the high seas, uh, with coastal communities around the world. Um, and so in the past 20 years, I've really worked on a, on a broad range of issues from um, overfishing and destructive fishing, uh, fish crimes at sea, protected areas, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, now I run a nonprofit called uh, Women for Oceans, uh, and uh, that is, it is focused on ocean health, obviously, uh, but uh, we try to really insert the feminine perspective into uh, ne the negotiations that are happening, into the solutions that we have, so that we can really uh, tap into our diversity uh, and into the full spectrum of what it means to be human and, and also to rediscover our place in the natural world, which is really important if we're going to turn things around. And yeah, over the years, as I said, spending a lot of time at sea, I've seen some of the most beautiful places in, 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 you know, the, in the world's oceans, but also some of the most egregious practices happening at sea. And so it really is my, my life mission to, to help protect the ocean for us and, and all the, the, the beings that we share this planet with. And it's an absolute honor, honestly, to have you here with the breadth of knowledge that you have. Uh, Tony, you and Oceans go a, a long way back. Tell us, tell us about it, a bit about the work that you do and your connection to the ocean. So my connection to the ocean started at the age of 17 when I joined the Navy. I joined the British Navy, uh, spent almost 30 years s serving with the British Navy around the world, sailed into every ocean, touched pretty much, uh, well, certainly every continent and maybe 50 different countries. Um, but what was quite clear to me that there were some challenges out there that, that were not going to be resolved just by having a high-tech vessel and we needed some other solutions. So I had the opportunity to, to move on from the Navy, um, join the NGO world, first at the Pew Charitable Trust, but now with Global Fishing Watch. And Global Fishing Watch is a really nice fit because it brings all of my experience from my time out at sea looking for things that just didn't want to be found basically, and that's what we need to do now, is, is shine a light on those things that people are just not aware of. So using artificial intelligence, big data, we're bringing together an awful lot of information. We call them insights. We turn the data into insights in order that everybody can have access to this platform for free, globally, equitable access, so we can start to really understand what's happening out on our ocean. So two people, brilliantly placed to answer questions about what's going on in the oceans and what we need to do about it. This session here is very much about making the invisible visible. Farah, having brought together over 35 different ocean specialities in your book, The Ocean and, and Us, what are some of the lesser known impacts that humans are having on our oceans? 
Sure. I mean, we've all heard, especially in the, in the previous presentation, you know, overfishing, pollution, climate change are affecting our oceans. And, you know, what does climate change mean on the ocean? It means that the ocean is acidifying, it's warming, the oxygen content is reducing, and all of this is having impacts uh, on life in the ocean. Um, but also just our everyday lives. A lot of us, even when we don't live by the sea or don't spend much time in the ocean, uh, don't realize that our, uh, you know, that what we do affects the ocean. So, for example, the choices we make uh, in our in our purchasing behavior. Most goods are shipped around the ocean, and shipping has a huge impact on uh, on life in the ocean. Uh, but also things like, you know, the the aquarium trade or um, the marine animal welfare. We we kill trillions of fish every year for seafood consumption, and it's done in the most barbaric way. But people don't realize that. I was just discussing yesterday with a friend that if you're in a restaurant, you know, you, you don't order a meat burger, you order a beef burger. And uh, with fish, you know, we just say fish burger. We have no clue, really, what's in, uh, what's in the food that we eat. Um, and so there's this real disconnect between uh, us and the ocean. And with the book, I really try to explore all the ways that our lives interact with the ocean. And I think we're going to come to it, but one of the you know, one of the things I also try to explore is what are the future impacts that we will have on the ocean? You know, uh, the high seas, for example, are, well, we're gonna come to that as well, but it's most of the ocean. And um, as we look into the next 50, 70, 80 years, how are we going to occupy that space? Are we going to be living on the ocean? Are we going to be living in the, under the waves? Um, because as, you know, as our population grows, as our land disappears due to sea level rise, we're going to have a new relationship with the ocean. And also an emerging threat that's coming up is deep sea mining, and I think we'll come, in, come to that as well, but uh, that's a new threat that's happening to the ocean on the high seas as well. Um, and uh, that is basically going to take place in the deep sea and destroy deep sea habitats irreversibly, uh, disturb locked away carbon. And so there, th these are things that we, we, as land animals, are not fully aware because we, we don't know, we don't understand our relationship with the ocean. Most of us don't. And so that's really what I try to do, is to, to, to try to bring forward all those challenges that we have and all the ways our lives impact the ocean. Well, I'm glad you put it in a book because it sounds like there's lots of them and I don't think we'd have time to go into all of them in great detail. So it's, it's good to know there's a resource that we can go back to. Tony, fishing is one of the largest um, activities that we do out at sea and overfishing is something that we generally know and hear about in terms of its impact. What other impacts should we be thinking about when it comes to fisheries and biodiversity? <coughs> yeah, there's, there's quite a few. I'll, I'll mention probably just three, but as highlighted, in, I mean, what's happening out there is out of sight and out of mind. So how, how do we bring this to you all to make you understand exactly what, what is happening and what might be done about it? We, we talk about destructive fishing and what is destructive fishing, things like trawling. You saw the images from Ghislaine earlier about how we're tearing up the seabed, uh, ripping apart the, the very land that the sea forests are growing on, whether it be coral, sea grass meadows. Sea grass meadows are really important when it comes to climate change. They sequester uh, CO2. Uh, and basically, it takes a long time for those areas to regenerate. So the people that are generally needing to draw on that resources are finding that their resources are in decline. So destructive fishing is something that has to be focused on, and it's generally very localized. Um, bycatch. Uh, in the Europeans, we're always looking, uh, and I say we, I know I'm British, but it's, I class myself as European. It, Europeans. It, it, let's not go there. Yeah, let's not. <laughs> the, uh, the bycatch situations, the fact that there are fish being caught that are not the targeted species, and what happens then? We've got to reduce the bycatch, but strangely, there's some perverse things happening. So if you go to Ghana, uh, there's a group called Environmental Justice Foundation. Take a look at their website. They're looking at an activity that they call Seiko. So the fishermen there, Normally, go out there, do their job, find their fish, bring it home for their families, etc. But the, the industrial trawlers have started to have a bycatch of the sardinella and uh, anchovy. And they've started to sell it to the local fishermen. And it became such a lucrative trade that they're now uh, deliberately targeting that bycatch. And there are now fishermen leaving their local villages that don't even go to sea with a net 
they just go straight to the industrial vessels and buy that bycatch from them. And that is a destructive practice that is breaking the economic situation in Ghana. So that sort of activity has got to stop. And then let's link it back into climate. If we're setting up marine protected areas around the world, we need 30% of the ocean, the right 30% of the ocean to be protected by 2030. If we're going to put a protection in place across the right vital critical habitats, then we have to be able to protect it. And that's one of the major issues is that we're really struggling to enforce and understand what's happening out there. Because if we protect the right areas, but then fail to enforce or stop the damage, then they're not going to have the impact that we need. So many different things to consider. I'm going to add another dimension to that consideration, which is often when we think about oceans, what's, what we're easily able to wrap our head around is coastlines. You know, we can, we can think of beaches and what's happening on the coastlines and coral reefs. That kind of feels easy. But the oceans are vast. And so we have these deep areas that we kind of forget about, like all the way out there. Tony, when it comes to like deep sea fishing. <laughs> is that, are there different problems there? You spoke about Ghana and that felt like it's closer to the coastline, but as we go further out into deeper waters, are the challenges that we're facing with the oceans different? Oh, there's huge challenges. I mean, the, the size and scale of the ocean is, as, as you've said, vast. I mean, I think it's four times as much activity happening out there as the same um, agricultural activity. How on earth do you watch two-thirds of the planet at the level that you can really understand and then take some action? So we might be able to see bad behavior, but if there's no patrol boats there, what do you do about it? You know, we, we've got to connect the facts of what we know is happening about where we can do it. We're humans. We're sort of limited in our capacity to degree. So when a vessel comes back into port, in the same way as when I travel, if I go to America, I have to show my passport, my visa, I have to have a reason to be there, money in my pocket, a return flight even. They, need, you know, they, they are asking me some basic questions that we're not asking fishermen around the world. We need to reverse the burden. So whatever they're doing out at sea, far, far from where you all can see just from the beach, we need to be able to ask those questions of the fishermen that are coming in to say, well, why did you disappear very close to that marine protected area? We couldn't see you on any of the tracking systems. And they should have to evidence why that is. And if they can't, they should not land their fish. And that will change behavior. It will also deter bad behavior because those that are getting away with it at the moment because the system is patchy and lax will have to stop. So there would be a big system change. So we need better eyes and better... We need some sort of way of being able to say, we need you to account for the activities that you were doing whilst you were way out in the vast ocean. Um, Farah, I know deep sea mining is one of those things that really gets your goat. <laughs> Tell us a little yeah. bit more about why is this such a big problem? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, just coming back to the vastness of the ocean, right? So most of the ocean is the high seas, right? That almost half of our planet are actually defined as the high seas. This means that these are areas beyond national jurisdiction. No single country has the jurisdiction to single-handedly or to control activities there. There's a, there are a patchwork of treaties and, and uh, conventions that try to manage some of the activities, like fishing, um, but there's no comprehensive uh, management regime out on the high seas. And this is what scares me the most, because it means that whatever we do on the high seas, there is little to no accountability. Right? So if you, if you commit a crime in your own national waters or on land or whatever, you can be taken to court, you can be held to account in your country. But uh, on the high seas, it requires political will. It requires, first of all, as Tony says, we need to identify or you know, catch people red-handed committing a crime. And then we have to find a country that will, will use their political clout, if you like, to, to, to hold the beneficiary of that activity, the country who's, you know, who the, 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 the vessel is flagged to, or the, in the case of mining, uh, whoever the company is, uh, which country it belongs to, that a country has to take that other country to court. And that's not going to happen. In my experience, spending time on the high seas, watching um, you know, illegal fishing happening on the high seas, I was unable to get, even though we had all the documentation, all the evidence, I was unable to get a country to hold another country to account 
on those matters. And so deep sea mining, just to also to give you a little bit of background about that, is an emerging industry. It doesn't happen yet on the high seas, uh, but there's this mad rush to open up the deep sea to mining um, in the name of the transition economy uh, for minerals to, to power our, you know, our electric batteries and so on. First of all, that argument is flawed, and I, I'm happy to talk to any of you afterwards about why that is. We have enough minerals on land. Our battery technology is changing and not requiring these scarce and expensive metals. Um, and also, uh, we can do much better in terms of um, uh, recovering metals from our waste streams uh, to... Uh, uh, insert back into our supply chains. So, but why, is, why does it matter that we mine in the deep sea? The deep sea, we're talking about four to six kilometers deep. Um, this area is very undiscovered uh, to, to date. We know more about the, the, the surface of Mars than we do the deep sea. But what we do know is that life in the deep ocean is very slow growing. There are fish there that reach several, you know, 150 to 200 years old, sharks 400 years old, there's corals that can reach several thousand years old. And as uh, you heard in the pre previous uh, presentation, uh, there are more uh, coral species in the deep ocean and in the shallow waters. Um, but most importantly, if we look at uh, the deep sea, it is also our biggest uh, um, s carbon store. So it's our biggest, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, there's all this carbon that's locked away in the seabed. And if we're going to start mining that, we are potentially re-releasing that carbon back into the water column with all the consequences uh, that come with that. So in, in the midst of a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis, we really shouldn't be embarking on a new crisis that is going to exacerbate both the biodiversity crisis, because we're going to wipe away species that will not return on human lifespans, and we're going to be uh, disturbing locked away ca uh, carbon. And it's an experiment we simply can't afford to, to carry out. I, I'm loving the passion. And, and as much as it's so important, <laughs> thank you so much. It is so important that we understand what the issues are and how we've got here. I also know that there are solutions. Now, they, they may be in their infancy, um, but there are, there are solutions out there. And, and Tony, I know you're doing a lot of work in terms of technology, especially in the fishery space. Do you, what is the role, is there a role for technology to play in terms of how we solve some of these problems we at least know about now and that will be made more visible to people today? Well, of course, technology works both ways. The, the technology is what's given the fishing fleets the ability to go further afield fish deeper, harder, longer than ever before. And in the last 50 years, we've seen significant decline in those fish, which you talked about overfishing earlier. So there's one element of technology that is, is driving what would be described as bad behavior. But that same behavior can be properly regulated and managed if we use appropriate technologies to empower that. I think most people these days you know, using mobile phones, computer, everyone's connected all of the time. That, that, Access to information is what we've got to harness. It, it, everyone says this all the time, but the reality is we have to communicate more clearly about what is happening. So, you know, in, in my last answer, in the sense of the challenges out there, the transparency, as we tend to refer to it, the transparency of information, the transparency of data, the transparency of activity is what's going to unlock something that's scalable, globally applicable, and actually it comes down to it all the time, affordable. If, if we want to use technology to monitor the whole ocean and we want to give it to private companies to do, it will be unaffordable and it will also be patchy because no one company will share with another company that they're rivals for, for profit. And, and actually, there is very little profit in the fisheries industry when it comes to the monitoring and control, the countries that need to look after it. So actually, very few companies are really very interested in doing this for the holistic good. So that's where I think transparency comes in and systems like Global Fishing Watch. And the other element of it is collaboration. I don't think any one solution fixes enough of the problem. So you have to be able to work out what your system can't do and find appropriate partnerships to fill those gaps. And that's part of Global Fishing Watch's world. We make sure that any gaps in our technology are filled by other partners in order to give a whole uh, and full answer to the problem. So the sum of the parts you know, the, the, the sum of the parts is much greater than the, the actual sum itself. I always forget that one. 
Oh, I, I can't remember it myself. I'm trying to fill it in for you, Tony. You get more. <laughs> you get much more for your money if you work together. And, and you know, you innovators out there, you're learning from everybody here in how your solutions can come together. Machine learning. I can only train my data to do something if I have the training data. Otherwise, it will be biased in some way or might have an ethical issue with it. So we've got to be careful how we use it. And if we work together, we can probably get much more from the technology. So a collaborative approach that drives transparency can see technology be a force for good. Farah, your book looks at a lot of solutions. Um, can you maybe share one or two of some of the creative, innovative solutions that you're seeing out there? Well, I mean, the, the, the book has 32 informative and inspiring chapters covering a whole host of issues. And, but there's a, there are a lot of common solutions across the different issues. Um, and, you know, it's, it, like I said before, it's from your purchasing behavior. It's, it's, but it's also, you know, how you vote, for example. Um, but in the most important um, sort of thread that came through all the sort of advice from these specialists is, you know, you don't need to be an expert to help save the ocean. Uh, you, you, you can inform yourself, you can inspire others around you, you can share whatever knowledge you have, you can support organizations. These are ways that you really can help the ocean. For example, last month I submitted a, a petition with over 340,000 signatures to the Dutch parliament uh, calling on the Dutch government to say no to deep sea mining. And that's only possible because so many of you signed that petition. So really uh, understand and know your agency, um, wherever you are in the world, whatever you know, whatever skill you have, you can apply it to helping the ocean and for that matter, any part of the world um, and all the issues that we face. So it's, um, but the, every chapter of the book has a list of things you can do to really help address that issue. It's too many to name here, but I, I do have a, a couple of copies of the book, so The Ocean and Us with me, so if you want to catch me afterwards, um, I can show that to you, yeah. I would absolutely love to talk to both of you for a lot longer, I absolutely would. Uh, have they not been brilliant? Um, however amount of time! So really quickly, for people who want to learn more, find out more, connect with you deeply, Tony, what's the best way to do that? Well, use the technology, get out there, look at uh, websites like Bloom, we saw some photos from there, uh, Environmental Justice Foundation, Oceana, WWF, uh, Global Fishing Watch, there's lots of information placed right out there, and the deeper dive behind the facts that are in the headlines there, you need to understand more, and then start to ask questions, ask questions of your members of parliament, your representatives, and make sure they understand that the ocean is important to you, and that if they want your vote, they have to act. Brilliant. Farah, how do people stay connected? Read The Ocean and Us. No, but seriously, uh, you know, the ocean gives us life. It provides us the oxygen we breathe. Uh, it regulates our climate. So just, just knowing that will help everyone care about our ocean because we need the ocean more than the ocean needs us. Just, yeah. And, and stay hopeful. <laughs> Thank you both so much. You provided us with a huge amount of hope. It's John and Farah. Give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. Oh, that moment when your iPad just won't reopen. How fabulous was that? We have a lot of movement going on behind me. Don't look at them, look at me. Don't look at them, look at me. Don't look at them, look at me. As soon as I say it, you're all looking at them, aren't you? You're like, oh, there's something going on behind you. Um, so that was a really brilliant session where we di dove deep into what's happening within the oceans. And often what helps us to bring things to life is a bit of art. Sometimes we think everything must be conveyed in words, but that isn't necessarily always the case. So. How many of you here have seen any of the uh, Minute Do dancers so far? Yeah? So there's quite a few of you who haven't had an opportunity to have that experience. Well, I've got great news for you. Guess what's about to happen? You're about to experience some transformational dance. Uh, please give an incredible warm round of applause for Minute Do's.
Thank you so much. What a beautiful interlude. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more, there are a collective of artists and dancers um, who use their bodies to express various different movements. The piece you just saw is an extract from a piece called Acume, and it's all about um, finding symbios Symbius with water. You can follow the group on Instagram. Their, um, their name, again, is... Minu dues. So if you want to find out a little bit more. Moving now on to our next session. Are you ready? Oh, I'm loving you as a crowd. You guys are lovely. You're making like my last time on stage this year at Change Now, like one of the best experiences. So thank you for being an epic audience. Um, so our next, se next session is all about looking at coral reefs and the importance of our corals. We hear about it a lot. Uh, we know that we need to save them. We know that they're endangered. But in terms of why we need to save them, how they became endangered, I really want to dig into that and learn 
what we can be doing to save our um, our corals. Our next speaker is French Polynesia, uh, is from Fr French Polynesia, uh, and he founded an organisation called Coral Gardeners when he was just a teenager, believe it or not. So absolutely dedicated to the cause. Please welcome the founder of Coral Gardeners, Titiwan Bacon. Thank you. Come join us. Hello. Oh, I love it. Hello. Good high five. Hello. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. What about you? I'm, I'm good. I, I, are you good. finding it cold here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, colder, colder than Tahiti for sure. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, the rest of us have been here like, oh my gosh, it's so, su it's so great. <laughs> the sun is out. And you're like, this is really chilly. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> context, people. Context counts. So. We're here to talk about coral reefs and some of the great work that you're doing at Coral Gardens. Um, but before we start there, what is a coral reef? Because I think we've seen pictures of the Great Barrier Reef, and so we all think we have an idea of it. But have we got it right, or is it something slightly different? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, first, for, for being here today. It's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. So coral reef, they became uh, all my life, like that's my daily work, and um, I, I just love them. A coral reef, it's like an underwater city. It's like, a, it's like Paris, you know, you have fish, you have sharks, you have species, and every one of them has a specific role to play. You have some little fish that are cleaning the, the shark's teeth, tooth, and uh, it's, it's, it's life. It's, one of, it's the most biodiverse, biodiverse ecosystem on the planet. That's the biggest, the biggest hot spot of biodiversity on Earth. It's the cor in the cor coral triangle, like close to Indonesia. And um, a coral is, is really hard to, to explain it, but it's, it's an animal. It's a colony of tiny animals that we call the polyps. They're a family of the jellyfish. And they, are like, they have tentacles, and they live uh, in a symbiotic relationship with a, a tiny algae that we call the zooxanthellae. So they're, a they're animals? Exactly, the corals are animals, correct. And why are they so, we hear a lot about them and there's a lot of um, press around loss of coral reefs. Why are our coral reefs so important? We call the, the coral reef the, the rainforest of the seas. They are, that's exactly uh, what they are and, and they are so important. Like they are, they are home for one quarter of all marine life. And even if the big dog teeth tuna doesn't live inside the corals, they, they, they need the tiny fish to, to live. You know, it's, it's like the balance, it's the base of the ecosystem. And our blue planet needs a healthy ocean. We need a healthy ecosystems. And coral reef, it's just life. It's, it's life on our planet, yeah. I love that you describe it as the forests of the ocean, because we understand forests and we understand the role that the forests play in cleaning the planet, in balancing life. And so to be able to see the corals as doing the same in the ocean, I think it's something that at least we can all relate to. Exactly. And like uh, my friends from Under the Pole said, it's, it's something we are not really familiar uh, with. You know, like a lot of people, they see trees, they are on land, but there is so much few people that have the chance and the opportunity to, to go under the surface and to see the coral reef, to see the fish. And so not enough people uh, talk about it. They don't know, like there is not enough action happening right now for, for them, yeah. Why are they so important? So, you know, we know that they're dying. How have, how have we got to this point? What, what is it that's killing our coral reefs? Is it some of the stuff that we were speaking, that Far and Tony and I were speaking about before? Is it something else? How have we got to this point, point that they're now endangered? Yeah, I mean, the situation is simple. Over there, they are here on our, on our blue planet for millions of years, but in just like a couple decades, we have lost half of the coral reef worldwide. Half? Half, like 50%. But the, the, but, the, but the world is 70% ocean, that's a lot of coral. E exactly, you have like, and France, it's the only country with coral reef in every ocean, has a big role to play in their conservation. So that's why I'm here today, it's to, to, to tell the story of the reef. And the, the coral reef, the scientists, they are clear. They estimate that if nothing is done by 2050, 90% of them will be condemned. So they could be the first ecosystem to entirely collapse from 
from our planet, and they, they are the ocean lungs. And the ocean is, is the lungs of our planet with the forest, so we, we need to do something, and, and now, yeah. But how did we get here? How, yeah. what, are we, what are we doing that means our corals are endangered? You know, I'm, get, I'm getting the impetus. We have to do something. The ocean is 70% of the world, and we're losing corals at a faster rate, it sounds like, than we're losing forests. But how, how are we killing them? What are we doing? So two reasons, the main two reasons why coral reefs are, are dying and disappearing around the world, the first one is global warming. Like the rising temperature of the water is going to stress the, the, the coral and they're going to bleach. We are talking about coral bleaching even happening at the Great Barrier Reef, in the Florida Keys, in Tahiti. And that's what's happening right now. It's like they're getting stressed and they bleach and they're dying. And uh, the second one is ocean acidification. And then if you combine this with like overfishing, runoff of the water, chemicals into farming. So we, yeah, it, it, this is what I call a global issue. Because to, today, right now, in Paris, we all breathe the same oxygen. And half of it is coming from healthy ocean. But with global warming, we are all responsible for, for them disappearing. So it's, it's, it, we are all connected to the coral reef and the ocean, and it's, it's a global issue. And that's maybe one of the biggest challenges that we are facing right now. But nobody's talking about it. We're talking about it here now, aren't we? We are talking about it here now. We're going to make it make Let's it. Let's do known. this. <laughs> so, Knowing about the problem is one thing, and it's all well and good to say, we have a big issue, we need to act, we have to do something now. Yeah. What can we do? I know you're doing great work at Coral Gardens. How do we, how do we, how do we turn this around? Yeah, exactly. The, I think uh, that the, 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 the change is, is happening. When I talk to all those people uh, at this event, there, there's clearly something going on. You know, we, we talk about to the new generations and the older ones, and, there are amazing innovation and solutions coming. And so there are a lot of great projects around the world that are restoring the reef. It's, uh, so we are planting trees on lands si since thousands of years. But it's only a couple of decades that we are planting corals. You know, we are gardeners on land. And my dream with coral gardeners was to create a new job to create, to be a gardener in the water, and that's what we did. I hired some of my fishermen, childhood friends, surfers, and now they are, they are gardeners, the reef guardians, like taking care of their favorite reef, and they needed to, to live. So I think we all have a, a role to play, like Tony and, and our dear friends were, were, were saying, we, we need to know about the ocean, we need to talk about it, about the planet in general, we need to see on a daily basis what we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. Me, I stopped eat, eating red meat like three years ago, and this is maybe a little change, but it's the biggest reason of, of carbon emission on the planet at the moment. So if you do some little changes and everyone are doing them, we'll have tremendous impact on the long run. So I think it's about supporting the people on the field, on the ground, like the organization. It's about doing our daily chances and just spreading the world, yeah. Uh, I, I like the way that you kind of bring it back. It is down to global warming. These things are not, they're all, everything's interconnected. And it's, it's easy to kind of go, the corals are over there. What am I supposed to do about it? But when you say, actually, the reason they're dying is because the temperatures are rising. And if temperatures are rising and we can all do something about it, it does bring it back to home. You also mentioned that you and your mates <laughs> grow coral. How the heck do you do that? <laughs> exactly so. I grew up on a tiny pearl farm, like a, a bungalow in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. Like we saw some picture of Mooria, French Polynesia, and spent a lot of time growing up uh, in the water, like the coral reef, it's, it's my playground. And when I was 16 years old, I went surfing, and I saw that my playground is, was, was changing and disappearing. So I said, I have to do something about it. So uh, I started planting corals when I was 16 years old. I will always remember that, that first afternoon when I met a marine biologist uh, on my island and I was introduced to what we call ecosystem restoration, the fact of, of gardening corals. Uh, crystal clear water, you have the nursery table, you have hundreds of little coral fragments growing, you're walking in the water and you have your fish coming in between your hands, around your, your face, and, and, and you're, you're just fragmenting your tiny coral, planting back. And you, co you come a couple months later, and it's twice the size, and you have already some, some tiny crabs and little damsel fish that, that choose your, your coral as their new home. 
And I, I told myself, this is the coolest thing on earth. That's what I want to do in my life. So <laughs> after that, I went to talk to, the, to all the big scientists, like from, from the CNRS, from the gum station of, of Berkeley. And, and I told them, guys, I'm 16 years old, and this is what I want to do. I want to be on the field to, to help the corals. What can I do? <laughs> and the big PhD, they told me, little buddy, calm down. <laughs> You're, you're getting a bit carried away. Yeah, you know, you're, you're but relax. You're only 16. Finish your high school. Do three years of biology degree. Do a master of five years of marine biology. And if you're smart and sharp enough, you do a PhD <laughs> of na eight, nine years before you can sit with us and maybe we study the reef together. Sounds like a long time. <laughs> yeah. And me, I was done with school. I, I look at them. I say, this is crazy. I, I love science. And I still believe that you can only protect and conserve and restore something you understand. Yeah. And right now we don't know enough about the reef, but being in laboratory, that, that, that wasn't me. So I told them that one day I will hire them. <laughs> 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 and this is what's happening right now. <laughs> now they're applying for a job. We have three full-time uh, doctors, like PhD level, working for coral gardeners, and, and it's game on, yeah. I love that as an inspiration because I think sometimes in this space there is that you need to be a scientist and, and, and at the same time there's nothing wrong with, we need you scientists, we're not anti-scientists, sure. we, we love you, do your good work. And it, we also need people like you who are just <coughs> ready to make things happen with what we've got right now. Completely, I mean we need way more scientists. We don't know enough about the core if we don't know the mechanisms, how they work. Uh, and we need people to be on the field to tell us how we can protect them. But also we need people who just love doing their work, love their playground, the ocean, the, the, the forest, and that's going to be hap happy being a gardener, not with trees and, and birds, but with, with corals and, 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 and fish. And, and, and I think that's the future, you know, we need the economy, the ecology to meet together and create purpose-driven jobs here. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a silly question about planting coral. Do you take a seed and <laughs> put it in the sand? <laughs> it's not exactly it, you know, we, corals are animals, so it's similar with plants, you know, when you have a forest happening on a forest of, of shen, like the big trees, you have some, some branches that are going to fall on the ground, and if you do your work correctly, you can take the healthy part of the branch, put it in a nursery for a couple months, and then plant it back onto the, in the ground. And that's exactly the same with the corals. We look for heat-resilient corals that we call the super corals. So uh, we have three marine biologists in the team, and they are going to patrol the reef during the stress period, the bleaching time, and identify the mother colony, 40 years old, that resisted to all the bleaching even happened in the past. And we're going to fragment those corals, put them into coral nurseries. We have thousands of corals at the moment growing in the nursery in French Polynesia. And then when they are grown up, when they are ready, we're going to plant them back into damaged areas of reef. And that's the final and, and last step. It's to see your coral growing and to bring back the, the marine life and biodiversity here. See, I've got an education because I was thinking there was a seed and there's no seed. <laughs> uh, so, so now we know how coral is grown. You've taken farming coral um, to a super high-tech arena, back to, the, back to the scientists he now hires. Um, <coughs> Tell us a little bit about your reef operating system. Yeah, thank you. So Reef OS, Reef Operating System, was the first technology we developed. Because like us as divers, we can only stay a couple hours in the water. And you, when you are out there, the fish, they don't behave the same way. So three years, four years ago, I was telling Tayano, Maurite, my, my early team member, my brothers from, from the island, guys, Look at what is happening at the Silicon Valley, at like Google, SpaceX, Tesla, all the breakthroughs. And we need, like, imagine if we, we could apply only 1% of, the, of those breakthroughs into ocean conservation and planting corals. We, we're going to speed up the impact. And they look at me and they say, but Tits, that, that's <laughs> my nickname, Tit1, how, how will you meet some, some Silicon Valley engineers? <laughs> yeah, on the island, everyone called me Tits. <laughs> and, uh, and Tayano and Maurite, they look at me and they say, Tituan, like, how will you meet some Silicon Valley engineers? We are in the middle of the ocean in Tahiti. <laughs> and 
three years and a half ago, I met uh, Dr. Drew Gray, uh, who was the first guy that Elon Musk hired to develop the Tesla self-driving car, the autopilot with AI. And I took his, one of his engineers on his honeymoon to Tahiti to plant coral with me, and he told me, hey, buddy, I have 30 minutes call with you and my, and my boss, like the CTO, and uh, just go for it. So I ended up on a Google Meet with Drew, and uh, I told him about the project, and that's, and he stopped me and he said, buddy, that's the first day I am quitting Silicon Valley to, re to realize my childhood dream, saving the ocean with technology, and I have no precise plan. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I was, okay, buddy, don't move. Coco, don't move from this call. And uh, I was just thinking about how we could use the ocean to see from the smartphone, the corals growing with AI, the number of fish coming back. And he, he stopped me and said, buddy, I, lo I love the vision, I love the story. Let's make this happen. So three years and a half uh, ago, Drew jumped into the project, and we created a new department, a research and development center called the CG Labs, the Coral Gardeners Labs, where we are developing the, solu the solutions of tomorrow for the reef. Like we have an artificial intelligence that can tell you in real, in real time the number of fish, which, which species coming back onto the reef that we are restoring. And we have an underwater application on the smartphone that is, is helping us monitor the growth and the health of the corals. And we have all those connected like sensors, cameras that are providing real-time data to the cloud infrastructure and to all of our experts, the scientists. And so we are using tech like Apple and Tesla did, but for the ocean, yeah. So you, you're rolling your sleeves up and growing Yep. You're looking at the data and the science, and then you've brought WYSIBANG technology into it as well. Exactly. So we try not only to have the scientists one side, the, the engineer one side, and the guys on the field. We bring them all under the same roof, like at CG Labs, and, uh, and we have PhD scientists from Berkeley, like high tech coming from SpaceX, like MIT, Tesla. And, and, and the guys, the gardeners, my buddies on the field, and they all together develop the tools that our coral gardeners, they need to be good at doing their job. I want them to be the James Bond of, of, of planting corals, yeah. I mean, it's clear you think small. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, is, what is your big vision? Because the way you're describing things <coughs> and how far things have come from the 16-year-old that was speaking to scientists and saying, how do I do more of this? Because I can see what's happening right at my shores. I used, to, I used to surf here, and now it's not the same. What is your big vision? If you and I were sat here in, say, five or 10 years' time, what, what is your hope for what not just Coral Gardens looks like, but what we've managed to do for the oceans? You know, when, when I'm in my garden, in front of my house, it's, it's my coral garden. You know, I, it's shallow water. You can walk like you're in a real garden, and, and you see the thing changing. You see the, there is less and less fish, there is less and less colors year after year. And with El Nino coming next year, it's, it's scary times for, for the ocean, for the reef, and for us, because it's, it's half of the oxygen we breathe coming from healthy ocean again. So, you know, six years ago when I started Coral Gardeners, I dropped out of school. I, I called my parents, I say, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm fucking dropping out, you know. I want to realize the project of my dream, start Coral Gardeners, and I will see what I can do for, for the reef. And, and I was in my bedroom with my little brother of 14 years old, and now we have 42 full-time employees, some of the world's best experts in, on the field. And, uh, I saw all the things that we were capable of doing in just six years of time, you know, like in 2019, we released a video that is in the top five of the most, of the most viewed video ever on the Instagram platform, like 78 million views, and we gained half a million followers in just uh, seven days. Like, I saw that today, wherever you are on the planet, whatever the academic background you have and the age you have, you can reach the world with important messages. And so my message, my message today to, to Paris, to France, and to the world is that, yeah, change is coming, clearly coming, and everyone can, can, can do something. And uh, I would love to take you all of you guys to, to plant some corals with me, to, no, no, but to be in the water, to see the impact, because I think it's so important to be able to, 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 
to make the invisible visible and to see the impact. And when you plant your coral and you see it growing and then you see the fish coming in your baby coral that you planted, that gives me hope for the future, yeah. You're leaving us. <laughs> your passion is so inspiring and you're leaving, it, it leaves each of us individually with no excuse for not taking action. For those of us who perhaps are a little bit scared of getting into the deep blue ocean. You have an adopt a coral yeah. program. How the heck do we do that? Yeah, we have, <laughs> a, we have basically a solution for, for everyone to join us in, in saving the coral. If uh, like a couple years ago, like six years ago, we were just a bunch of school dropout surfers, fishermen, and I was like, no way we're gonna get some governmental funding. Uh, and <laughs> today we have supporting by Amazing companies. Our biggest sponsor at the moment is Rolex. We joined one year ago the initiative Perpetual Planets. I'm, su I'm super happy and honored to, to be able to represent this initiative. And six years ago, this didn't exist. So I was like, how we are going to found our mission? So people were adopting stars. And I was like, we have thousands of corals growing in the water. Why don't people from Paris, from New York, from Australia, can adopt a coral on our website. For, and and, and, and we, I launched a program with my little beer. I was building the website with Tayano, and we put the picture of the corals, and then a, an American people adopted the first coral. We ran in the water to plant the coral, take a picture and send in, and then all his friends adopted some corals for, for 25 euros, and we we're like, wow. In, during the day, we can plant coral, raise awareness, develop the innovation, and at night, we send the adoption certificates and we allow people to jump in the mission. And so today, we had more than 40,000 people who adopted corals. We, were, we raised millions of euros thanks to that for the mission. And that's a simple way for everyone to join. So the website is it's coralgardeners.org. And today, you can, you can be the, the mom or dad of, of your coral and see it growing on the live stream. And this is just how we exist and we can continue the hard work here. I can see lots of coral parents about to be born. Uh, Tetuan, thank you so much for joining us. What an inspiration. Please give him an incredible warm round thank of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. That, uh, that concludes our sessions on the oceans making the invisible visible. Please do take a chance to go and have a look at the details of all the various different speakers that we've had, we've had today. The explorers are out in the gardens. We've got John and Farah in front of us. It's one you can go and adopt yourself a coral. My name's Lavalda Vincenzi. It has been an absolute pleasure uh, moderating this session for you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and until next year, have a great time. Bye for now.